Much of British airspace could close tomorrow because of Iceland's volcanic ash cloud. The government is warning it'll be the UK's busiest airport that will be worst hit. Ed Miliband will challenge his brother and run for the leadership of the Labour Party. Violence continues on the streets of Bangkok as the crisis in Thailand deepens. And an easy win for Dundee United gives them their first Scottish Cup final trophy in 16 years. A very good evening. Air passengers are being warned that parts of British airspace may have to close tomorrow if a cloud of volcanic ash from Iceland heads further south. The Department for Transport has warned it could affect air travel until Tuesday. Joe Lynham is at Heathrow for us this evening. Joe. Yeah, good evening and welcome to a warm and sunny Heathrow Airport. Europe's busiest airport could become a very quiet place tomorrow or the day after, especially if the wind changes. Just when you thought it was safe to take to the skies again, the ash is back. The latest forecast from the Met Office and the Department for Transport seem to suggest that parts of the UK, including the very busy southeast, are likely to be closed between Sunday and Tuesday. If so, it would heap even more misery on weary passengers, thousands of whom took days to get back from the last ash shutdown. That grounded 100,000 flights around Europe, stranding 8 million passengers and costing the airlines 1.3 billion pounds, money they want back from taxpayers. Morning, Mr. Hallen. And this is the man who will ultimately be making the decision on whether it's safe to fly, the new Transport Secretary Phil Hammond, alongside the Civil Aviation Authority. Many accused them of being overcautious last time in grounding planes. So now passengers, airlines and the entire new government will all hope that they are judicious this time. We may not even be at the halfway mark yet, but already 2010 is proving to be a year many will want to forget. Joe, with volcanic ash and BA strikes, not a great time for air travellers. No, there's not. But there's a little bit of movement behind the scenes on the BA strike. We know on Monday that the conciliation service ACAS will be chairing talks between both opposing sides. Before that, the Transport Secretary, Phil Hammond, a lot on his plate these days. He'll be meeting both sides independently to get an assessment. And then there's the legal action. BA's lawyers are taking action in the High Court also on Monday. They want to take out an injunction to prevent the strike. They say that the balloting procedure wasn't right and proper and it should be done again. The union, of course, denies that vehemently. So for BA passengers, it's a case of if the, if the ash doesn't get you, perhaps the strike might. Joe, thank you. Joe Lynham at Heathrow there. Thailand's Prime Minister says the army will press on with its operation to end an anti-government protest in the centre of Bangkok. At least 22 people have been killed since clashes began there three days ago. Alistair Leithhead reports. Welcome to Bangkok, what tourists call the land of smiles. But there's a lot of unhappiness in this country. And for another day, it was pouring out on the streets of the capital. The troops are trying to break up anti-government protests, which have already lasted weeks, firing shotgun pellets at anyone who came too close. They're just a few hundred metres apart. A short but dangerous dash down the main highway, the mob were not being deterred. Using what they had to take on the army. It's amazing how chaotic it's become down here. The protesters setting fire to tyres, provoking the military. We're just a short distance away. Uh, those are bangers going off, but the military have been shooting at the protesters here. It shows just how deeply divided Thailand's become. This anger's been simmering for years. A hatred from the poor against the rich, stirred up by a corrupt former prime minister. Passers-by are getting caught up in it. They suspect snipers. The army called this street a live fire zone. They're shooting sniper from the on top of this hotel and three people die. 
There have been more deaths and injuries today in isolated flush points, but the Prime Minister said his troops were defending themselves. The protesters still hold the city centre. Trying to move them with force could slip this country further into chaos. Alistair Leith at BBC News, Bangkok. The former Energy Secretary Ed Miliband has confirmed that he will stand for the leadership of the Labour Party. His decision pits him against his older brother David, the former Foreign Secretary. Here's our political correspondent, Rita Chakrabarti. Hi, Sandra. Ed. Smiles and a handshake as Ed Miliband arrived to announce that he was the second Miliband to throw his hat into the ring for the Labour leadership. My message to the British people is we will learn from our mistakes. We will be part of your values again. We will be part of your community again. He criticised aspects of the government to which he had belonged. It had misjudged on immigration and lost trust catastrophically over Iraq. Older brother David made his leadership announcement three days ago, surrounded by supporters. There's now a vacancy for the leadership of the Labour Party and there will be an election for that post. I will be a candidate in that election. David Miliband is thought to be the front runner. Aged 44, he was foreign secretary in the last government and is a former advisor to Tony Blair. Brother Ed went to the same Oxford college and took the same degree. He's 40, a former cabinet minister and used to be advisor to Gordon Brown. You do my usual when you're ready. Will another Gordon Brown ally stop this Sorry. race from being purely a family affair? Ed Balls out in his constituency today would only say that he wanted to talk to voters first. The fact is, you've got to listen and you've got to hear what the people here are saying. It can't be us debating internally and then talking to the country. You've got to listen to the country, hear what they're saying, understand why they didn't think we were always on their side. That's the only way to make sure we're ready whenever the election comes. Other possible contenders are Andy Burnham, the former health secretary, and John Crudders, a left-wing backbencher. A potentially wide field. At least the Miliband's mother knows who she's supporting. But her candidate for the Labour leadership will be John Crudders. <laughs> Rita Chakrabarti, BBC News. A woman has been charged with the attempted murder of Labour MP Stephen Timms. Roshanara Chowdhury stabbed Mr Timms during a constituency meeting in East London yesterday. He's said to be recovering well following surgery. The 21-year-old will appear before magistrates on Monday. The Ulster Unionist leader, Sir Reg MP, has announced he's to stand down within the next few months. His party failed to win any seats in the general election. Making the announcement after a meeting of his party's executive, Sir Reg said he would be working to help the party develop a new strategy. Google has apologised after admitting that cars taking pictures for its 3D mapping service have accidentally been collecting personal data sent over unsecured wireless networks. The company says the mistake happened in Britain and more than 30 other countries over a four-year period. Maddie Savage has the story. Google's been zooming in on towns and cities across the UK. Now it seems it's zoomed in even closer than it planned. The companies admitted collecting personal data about people's home computers. The information was gathered using these Street View cars, the same ones that take close-up photos of people's homes and gardens for the 360-degree Street View service that launched in the UK last year and raised concerns about privacy. Google decided to use the cars for a second purpose, to search for secure wireless internet hotspots, such as cafes and hotels. It was part of a project to help users pinpoint where they were on a map. The company says there was a coding error and it ended up collecting personal data from unsecured networks. Google won't admit exactly what it found, but experts say it could include snippets of emails, photos and website addresses. What we're clear about is here that we made a mistake and we're determined to learn the lessons from that and make sure this sort of thing can't happen again. So we're going to have an internal review looking at our procedures to make sure that we've got robust things in place to make sure that this sort of thing is properly addressed in future. We'll also have an external review of what happened in this case. Street view cars haven't just been used in the UK. These are all the places where people could be affected. More than 30 countries across five continents. It's thought the company may be in breach of data protection and privacy laws.
I think Google could face legal difficulties, not just under data protection laws, but also the laws in many countries that make interception illegal. So we might see action from regulators, we might also see legal action from individuals that have been affected. Google says it's now speaking to data protection authorities to ensure the information is deleted as quickly as possible. But the damage to the company's reputation may not be so easy to erase. Maddie Savage, BBC News. Eurostar passengers have been hit by delays following an alert in the Channel Tunnel. Rail journeys were temporarily suspended after a carbon dioxide detector went off early this morning. The nearest train, a shuttle carrying 30 lorries and drivers, was evacuated and taken back to the UK. The Afghan president, Hamid Karzai, has become the first foreign leader to visit David Cameron since he became prime minister. Mr Karzai and Mr Cameron had talks at Chequers. A Downing Street spokesman said they'd agreed the relationship between Afghanistan and Britain should be further strengthened. At least 12 people have been killed and hundreds of thousands forced to evacuate their homes after heavy rain caused flooding in China. The floods have affected over 400 townships across Zhangji province. Residents describe the disaster as the worst in many years. More heavy rain has been forecast for the region in the coming days. Dundee United have won the Scottish Cup final. They put an end to the fairy tale story of surprise finalists Ross County, beating them 3 0. Laura Maxwell reports from Hampden Park. It was a modern-day Highland clearance. Ross County rallied a support of 20,000, four times the population of their hometown of Dingwall. Dundee United's fans, starved of cup success for 16 years, also eager for the silverware. And the Hampden crowd didn't have to wait too long for the action. County's Gary Miller earning a yellow card for this tackle. United, though, put the free kick over the bar. Dundee United's Danny Swanson got the best chance of the first half, but County cut him off at the pass. They couldn't stop United this time, though. A bungled clearance allowed David Goodwillie to put United one ahead, swiftly booked for this celebration. Goodwillie involved again for the second goal, allowing this superb left footer from Craig Conway. And with just minutes to go before the final whistle, Conway did it again, putting Dundee United three ahead and ending County's dream. Dundee United! And as Dundee United salute their fans, it's been a superb ending to this 125th Scottish Cup final. Dundee United take home the silverware tonight, a superb end as well to their centenary season. Laura Maxwell, BBC News, Hamden. Meanwhile, south of the border, Chelsea have won the FA Cup final, beating Portsmouth 1-0 at Wembley. It means they've clinched the league and cup double, as Dan Rowan reports from Wembley. Come on, Pompey! After relegation and administration, this was Portsmouth's chance for a dream end to a nightmare season. At stake for Chelsea, a league and cup double and a place in history. This was the Premier League's princes against Pompey's paupers. Although the latter could have taken an unlikely lead, Piquion denied by Czech. Portsmouth's cup run in adversity has defied belief at times this season, and so it proved here, as time and time again their goal enjoyed a charmed life. The woodwork coming to the underdog's rescue no fewer than five times in a one-sided first half. Chelsea were beginning to wonder if it wasn't to be their day, especially when this happened. Portsmouth had their chance, but Prince's penalty was poor. Chelsea had survived, and almost immediately, Drogba finally broke the deadlock. The champions had chances to seal it, Lampard also missing from the spot, but 1-0 it stayed. Portsmouth's season to forget, ending in more despair. Chelsea able to celebrate the club's first ever double. Dan Rowan, BBC News, at Wembley. In Formula One, Mark Webber qualified fastest for tomorrow's Monaco Grand Prix. He beat Renault's Robert Kubitska and his Red Bull teammate Sebastian Vettel. McLaren's Lewis Hamilton was fifth and defending champion Jensen Button eighth. And you can see more on the day's stories on the BBC News channel. And I'll be back with the latest from the newsroom at 10.35. Now on BBC One, it's time for Reporting Scotland. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.